Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome you here to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum uh, at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. I'm very much pleased to welcome all of you. I'm uh, pleased that you managed to find your way th through whatever limited sidewalks still exist and found a place to park and everything else. Uh, it's certainly been a very tough, tough uh, time in Boston. And we certainly have with us a guest who's a sh who has a thing or two to show us about how to deal with snow, among other things. So, uh, so uh, this, is, this event is part of a larger set of activities around Public Service Week here at the Kennedy School. It's something that was originally started uh, uh, by President uh, Drew Faust and something that the Kennedy School has adopted uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and so it's uh, a week of activities ranging from um, a terrific guest speaker tonight to a whole variety of other activities, um, including a day of service on, on Friday. So I encourage you to participate in all those uh, and the like. And I do especially want to help thank, uh, for this particular event, the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy, the Mosavad Romani Center for Business and Government, the Student Public Service Collaborative, and lastly and most importantly, the Institute of Politics, who put all this together for us uh, for their terrific work. So, um, well, we have the person we have here with, her, with us tonight is President uh, Taria Halon, um, the uh, former president of Finland. She served two terms in Finland as the president, and she currently serves as our Angelopoulos Go Global Public Fellow, Public Leaders Fellow. Um, the Angelopoulos Fellows Program is specifically designed to bring former heads of state to the Harvard Kennedy School so we can learn from each other. One of the striking features about uh, particularly democratic governance is we elect people, we give them enormous authority and responsibility, and then we, then they cease to be the, in those positions of responsibility and authority. And oftentimes their wisdom, their insights, their ideas and so forth are then ambiguous. How are they put to use and so forth? Now the great ones, President Halonen to be as a prime example, find themselves very busy doing a whole variety of activities. But we'd like, we, 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 the Angelopoulos Fellows Program is precisely to give an opportunity for us to learn from such leaders, for them to learn from us, and to, for them to have a chance to reflect on how they might best use the extraordinary talents that they bring uh, for future public leadership. Um, I should mention that this, this uh, Global Fellows Program was created as a result of the extraordinary generosity of Ambassador Gianna Angelopoulos. Um, uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos is a, um, was an Olympic organizer, ambassador to the Greek state, a lawyer, and former member of par parliament. Um, in 1996, the prime minister of Greece actually asked her to run the campaign to bring the 2004 Olympics to Greece. Uh, that campaign was successful, as we all know, uh, and indeed in 1998, remember this 2004 Olympics, uh, she was given this ambassador at large designation as an honor for her work. Um, however, by the year 2000, the Greek Olympics were somewhat in doubt. People were worried, indeed, there were r rumors that the Olympics were in that disastrous condition and so forth, so uh, uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos was suddenly asked to come in and take over the uh, Athens uh, 2004 organizing committee, and what resulted was um, an Olympics that IOC President James Rogge called an unforgettable a dream games. And there's a wonderful best-selling book about this and other things that uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos wrote called My Greek Drama, a great title, Life, Love, and One Woman's Olympic Effort to Bring Glory to Her Country, and indeed, uh, uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos is very much a citizen of the world, but she's very devoted to her home country of Greece um, and has throughout her life, in, here at the Kennedy School and many other settings of the global, Clinton Global Initiative and the like, uh, been a tireless person who wanted to figure out a way to help Greece realize its remarkable potential, something it not, has not always done. And currently, obviously, it's a particularly trying time. Let me uh, ask all of us to give Angela, Professor, I mean, uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos, who's not here today, but I think may be listening, a big hand. Thank you for including me. Thank you. Well, I will say that my personal thanks also. I have witnessed the, the uh, Athena Olympics. It was really a great event. You, it it <laughs> was truly amazing. Uh, let me also thank Nick Burns, Pete Zimmerman, Barbara Whalen, all of whom have done a great deal to make this all happen. And so. So uh, 
Tarja Halonen, Halonen is the 11th was the 11th president of the Republic of Finland and Finland's first female head of state. She uh, was elected first in March to uh, took office in March 2000 and was re-elected in 2006. She has a really quite remarkable and lengthy background in public service, having held numerous elected and appointed positions. She has 17 honorary degrees, an amazing number of uh, national and foreign decorations. You just go on to Wikipedia at some point. I'm, I didn't even know some of these extraordinary things even existed, two or three from Sweden and then dozens of others all through it. She's been a tireless champion of working people, of human rights, very much including gay rights, gender equity, sustainable development, and so much more. Um, she graduated from the University of Helsinki, uh, has a Master's of Laws degree. Uh, she was a lawyer with the Central Organization of Finnish Trade Unions. And in 1974, she was appointed a parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister. She then was elected to Parliament in 79, re-elected four times. She also served then as the five terms on the Helsinki City Council during much that same period. Um, eventually ascending to being chair of the Social Affairs Committee, she became minister um, at the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health, minister responsible for Nordic cooperation, minister of justice, and then minister of foreign affairs. During her time as foreign minister, Finland held the first time, for the first time, the EU presidency. She was also she served as the co-chair of the World uh, Commission on Social Dimension of Globalization. Uh, she has uh, been served as chair of the Council World, of Women World Leaders, and she has been an inspiring leader on social justice and many other issues. In 2010, she was appointed co-chair of the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Global Sustainability. She, indeed, in 2013, she presented an index at the UN uh, Climate Change Conference, which looked at gender equity for sustainable development and climate change. And at the time, she stated, it's easier to change the world for the better if both men and women have an equal say in climate change negotiations. So uh, she comes from very humble roots. And indeed, um, uh, President Halonen, let's welcome you, and then I'll turn to asking her questions. So please give me a round of applause. So you were bor born during World War II. Yes. Um, and ultimately re uh, rose to be the first woman president of Finland. Help me understand kind of what led you there. You were in a working class family. I mean, what, 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 what inspired you? How did you get there? So uh, I always say when it's a question that who has seen the war, I say that yes, I, I was born in the last uh, uh, war Christmas um, of, um, of my country. It was a second world war, which also reached Finland. Uh, it was a fight between Soviet Union and, and Finland. Um, yeah, we, we didn't take quite the victory, but um, we, <laughs> we kept our independence, and, and I think that we also reached uh, respect. I think that uh, uh, Finland, uh, my family, but whole Finland and all Western Europe was quite poor after the Second World War. So to be poor was nothing unusual. And uh, we didn't notice it too much because everybody else was poor. But um, then uh, it was uh, some kind of the spirit uh, that the future is better because it was peace. We were reconstructing the, the country. And um, we have also the model of the other Nordic countries, especially Sweden, where we belong. We belong 700 years before, we, before the Swedish king lost the war against the Russian Tsar 18. 1809, and then we were 100 years uh, independent Grand Duchy of, uh, of Russia. And then when they started to make a Red Revolution, they had something else to do, so, so we declared ourselves independent. Good timing. So, good timing. That's in, important in history, very, very important. But, uh, but then I think that, uh, um, so we didn't consider that it's something unusual that if you're coming from the working class family that you would try to get something else. Uh, my parents, like uh, thousands of other parents, they invested a lot of um, money, well, there's more money in the education of their children. And I think that that was one of the reasons why then we were also ready for the big reform of the educational system so that it became uh, free of charge. And even my own parents said that, yes, it was pretty expensive, but we are happy that now parents uh, don't uh, need to do that. And so in that way, I think that um, even, of course, we have a differences between the 
uh, the families, but uh, if you are richer or less rich, but, but it's not so unusual in Nordic countries, especially in Finland. Um, that was the time when uh, thousands and thousands of people became first time academically educated and, and uh, also they moved from the rural areas to the cities. I was born in Helsinki and, and uh, so I, I have been a city girl in that way. But um, it was a positive time in that sense. I, I didn't decide to become a politician, no, no, no. I wanted to become a painter and artist. My parents said to me, don't think of yourself. Think that how you could be more useful. I think that art is useful, but they didn't think so much. And so I became a lawyer. And, and then uh, I was also radical at my university time. That was normal in the 1960s in Europe. It was all over Europe, the continent. So I was just a representative of my generation. Uh, when I then was a qualified lawyer, I, I uh, started serving in the center organization and the Finnish trade union movement. Uh, you would say here in USA, labor unions. And my parents were happy. Uh, the education has not spoiled the daughter. She came back and worked with the other workers and, and, and so on. And then the prime minister you mentioned, she asked to get somebody for his political uh, uh, circle to, to help him. And I happened to be that one. And after that, once I attended to the parliamentary elections, paying 1,000 American dollars for campaign, it was not quite enough. <laughs> and, and so I didn't go in. But the next time, I continued in unions. Uh, next time then I was uh, pregnant, I got my baby in the late November uh, 1978. And uh, then I have a nice little baby girl who didn't sleep too well. And, and uh, then it was the parliamentary elections. And then in March, I was a member of parliament. Um, the unions didn't like too much that I was involved in, in politics, but because I have my maternity leave, so I could do what I could. And, and uh, so since that, I have been in the parliament. So I mean, it's not the persons themselves normally who decide that I want to become a politician, but they are their friends who say that, hey, you might be a good one. Why don't you candidate? And so it starts. I will give warning. And then suddenly you notice that you will be in city council, you will be in the parliament, or you might be a, a member of the government. Because uh, if you are willing yourself and your, your, your uh, friends and colleagues will, uh, will uh, have an, uh, confidence with you, so it will come sooner or later. I always say that fix more to the issues and not for your own career. It's, it's much easier. And uh, in, our, in other conversations you know, that I've had, you talked about whether one thought about I or we. Yeah. Say more about that. Yeah, so, but that's very normal. It was in my family, in our family. They always said, uh, I have repeated in many places, because that's true, <laughs> that uh, my mother said sometimes that uh, when we said, that, oh, that's not fair, that's not nice. So she said to us, that, yes, my dear, the life is not always fair. But that's why we are here, that we make the world better. Uh, she had very hard background in, in, in her childhood, um, uh, civil war, two wars, and so on. But, uh, but the, we learned it somehow that uh, you have to be happy when you can do something. And uh, so um, it was very natural for us that uh, it's always we, not only the family, but we. And I think uh, I I think I see here some of the things. I think that they, they know that. It's a Nordic way, we, um, in a way. We are small countries, and, and so you don't do too much with the five million if everybody thinks only by, by, by him or herself. But then uh, at the university, I, I think I have once told it to you, so I, I became more, indiv uh, more individualistic. I noticed that human rights and a certain person can be almost as important that it could be the part of we. And this is also concerning the sexual minorities. That, gay uh, rights, gay yeah, rights. Yeah, the gay rights, that you are part of us. It's your sexual identity, and you should have the right to be it openly, freely, without any pressure. And we are all different, but uh, we are we. And that's it. Mm. So easy.
that's that's great. And so as you um, in your uh, a, a, as you moved along, you you focused heavily on economic, social, and the environment. Um, and it seems like you move comfortably between those. They're kind of integrated. How do you think about those those combinations? And you know, how do we make economic and environmental policies really compatible? This is really very very important and difficult issue because um, I already explained that how the Nordic welfare society is very much based on we. It's a certain positive collective trend. But when I was a young one, nobody thought that uh, the resources of this planet, the natural resources, are limited. We thought that it's, it's just, we need to get more and more and more. And, and I think that also the saying we, in many ways in Europe, it was we Europeans. We didn't think so broadly that it's, it's the population of the whole planet. And uh, nowadays, it's, uh, I think, and it has been through my later career all the time, the saying that uh, if we take seriously the human rights, and if we take seriously the uh, planetary boundaries, so we have to somehow to find a new share, the shared society. The only resource what I think is, is uh, unlimited is a human capital. In that way, my own nation has been very lucky in investing in education, because there you can, you can invest as much as you like, and it will give a better and better results. It's not a threat for the planetary boundaries. But uh, if you think that we have uh, just unlimited amount of the all kind of minerals and, and, and so on. And then the another thing, what I think that uh, it was Club and Rome, which was the first time to make this report, what is the status of the world. Then the Norwegian Prime Minister, Gruhar and Brundtland, made it w with the Brundtland Commission. And then suddenly we noticed that, hey, we have only one planet. And then the scientists came and helped us to say, that it's not that you believe so, it's the fact. And now when you are from the university, so I always say the, repeat the same what I said in Rio plus 20, I said, release the scientists. They have to have a right to speak with the audience, not only with the leaders. Leaders are important because they make an important decisions. But politicians in democratic countries, they will be elected by the will of the people. And then the better is, <laughs> the better is the people, the better politicians they will get. And in that way, I think that uh, we have to remember that uh, sustainable development is a modern trinity. Um, and we have to respect the planetary boundaries, but we have to put the people in focus because we are the only ones who can make these decisions concerning the sustainable development. But if we demand that the people should be responsible, so we have to empower them. So now I start preaching again, but never mind. No, no, <laughs> but I have and so how it. do we empower them? I mean, at that one level, I mean, in this country, um, many people are skeptical about climate change, though uh, uh, certainly, uh, it's certainly, we've certainly seen a winter like no other yeah, here. Yeah, you mean that the Boston people especially. Yeah, don't. right here in yeah. Boston. Yeah. Um, many people are skeptical. Uh, how do you build that coalition, particularly in a world, in a situation where you've got to bring together so many disparate parts of the world with so many different stages of development, so many different views about what's fair and uh, equitable? Um, first, of course, uh, I always, uh, I, I want to underline the fact that uh, Mr. Pachauri, who is the chairman, the president of the climate panel in UN, he always says, make a difference between the weather and the climate. But of course, um, it's very good if the, old, uh, if the people, and an average people are looking around and seeing that is this what we have used or is this different? And uh, we have used it quite much in Finland. For instance, when we are interested in the Baltic Sea, which is nearby us, and, and we want to make it cleaner than what it is. So it's, it's good that people make a question. And then we can answer here to the Boston people that extreme phenomena uh, are the part of the climate change, that it can happen so that you have the winter where we are lacking the snow in Helsinki. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it can be also unusual weather. But uh, I think so that uh, for me, a good lesson was uh, in 2000, I think two, when we started by the, it was an ILO which decided to make a World Commission concerning the social dimension of globalization. 
And those who are, how could I say, a little bit older here, they might remember themselves that in early 2000, there were a lot of all kind of demonstrations, both here in USA, also in Europe and many other countries, especially when UN had the meetings, there were bigger demonstrations. Some people said that the globalization will be the key, the door to the better future, because then we can take the whole planet with us. The others say that globalization is a terrible thing, which steals the jobs and is, is at the same time close in, uh, in my, my home yard, but I cannot touch it. And when I started co-chairing this uh, commission, and those members were practically from the different parts, different sides of the parigades. And um, we were co-chairing the president of Tanzania in that time, Benjamin Macap and I, and we thought that what could we do with these people in order to get the consensus report when they, they, they come from the different sides, that even being the union lawyer and where I'm, I'm used to have a negotiations, so I think that that's the impossible task. But then we took an, about six months or a little bit more, a honeymoon in a way with, uh, with this commission. They learned to know each other and they were interested, oh, he's interesting and she's interesting, versus, oh, have you heard what he will say? And then they learned to respect the experience of each other, which was very true in many ways because the globalization has a dual face. And then we succeeded to see that employment, decent jobs, decent work, is one of the key issues of sustainable development. It was not in millennium goals. That was later. We made it later. But now it will be. And now it, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that in sustainable development goals, in SDGs, it is, it is already in the draft. And I think it will, will be there also in the final, final paper in September. And, and so I think that uh, this is what my, my father said very often to me when I was speaking about the liberties and, and the new democracy in, in, at the universities and so on. He said to me, a young lady, it's not only freedom or bread, it's freedom and bread. And, and I think that this is still true, that when we think about the sustainable development, people have to think they, they earn it tomorrow and their children and all that. But there are other ways how we can combine it. So I, I think that you have to respect the experience of your fellow citizens. And, and then it's a start for understanding, not always and not with everybody, but with the most of people. Now, a lot of people look to the Nordic countries um, and say, gee, that, that they're amazing. Um, people, some, the Nordic welfare state is sometimes praised, sometimes despaired. Um, and so tell me, tell me about what that is. Um, what's special? Uh, what makes these countries work? What makes your country work? I think that you can, uh, um, you share the same basic ideas in, in a way that, of course, the democratic society with respecting the human rights, good governance and, and um, no corruption and such kind of things. Uh, also the transparency of the society so that you know how your tax money will be used. Uh, but, but then we notice that it's, all, it's not only this um, citizen rights or political rights, it's also the question of your freedom and bread. It's a question of your uh, economic, um, cultural and social rights which make you your dignity as a, as a, as a human being. And uh, that's why in the Nordic welfare state or welfare society, depends how you see it, it's very important that uh, you try to fulfill also these other human rights so that you are the full human personality. And um, then we have in all Nordic countries, in Iceland, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, we have uh, invested quite much in s also in service side, not only insurance systems, but uh, the public ser uh, services, which is now very good fitting together your week. Uh, the public services, and uh, we are small countries, we are all together, the population is about the Netherlands, the population of the Netherlands, but it's a large area where we are living, uh, yes, in the north, but anyway. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it has, it 
we think that people think that it gives them justice for them. It, it's really they feel that they are equal in that sense. Not everybody makes a success, but anyway. And, and so then other side is that uh, when the globalization came to the Nordic countries, so many people said, especially the economists, they were very worried that they said to us that, you see that it's a fine idea, but uh, we think so that we cannot continue like that in the globalization. It's so expensive. But then, thanks for the international statistics, we noticed that it's not only fair, but it's also very good in competition. Uh, we have made a lot of good, uh, good, uh, good economics, and, and we are very, we are not, we cannot say, as a good thing, I shouldn't say that we are good. I should say that we are not too bad um, in, uh, in many, many senses, and you should say all the time that I'm good. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is then Finnish system. But, uh, but the, then we notice that, yes, you can get the both. You can be competitive, and you can also to strengthen the cohesion of your own society which I think is, is uh, marvelous. And part of that is clearly a big investment in education. And mm. Finland is, is that wrong? Um, it's not too high. It's, it's just a smart investment. Okay, it's a smart investment yes. in education then. Uh, Finland gets a lot of, you know, it comes out very high on international rankings. It yes. gets a, uh, people turn to it for a model. What, is, what makes education in Finland special? I heard that there is uh, the book uh, which means the smart kids, the smartest kids of the world. I don't know whether the kids are smarter, but, but the education system is quite good in, in such a way that um, um, I think that the very smart persons in our society is perhaps the same. I don't know. I'm not interested in that. But if I think the modern society in a sustainable uh, development and in globalized world, what makes a sense, what makes a difference, and what OECD has noticed very well in this report is that how equal is the education, how good is the result taking the whole population? Because uh, the modern society doesn't work well if not every citizen, every people there can also do his or her best. And I think this is now the, the issue. We start our comprehensive school quite late at the age of seven because uh, we have normal that we have the three months snow and we don't close the, close the schools when, we have, uh, when it's snowing. Um, and uh, so... Um, uh, we do. Yeah, <coughs> but if you would have it three months, you would stop it. <laughs> but I understand that it's not, it's not perhaps an investment if you have only a few days or very short time. So uh, anyway, so uh, I think that uh, we are interested, of course, of smart kids, boys and girls. Girls are doing normally better than boys if they have the equal opportunities. They are not smarter, but they, they understand that education will give for them better possibilities for the future, especially for the girls. But, uh, but then uh, we are also interested of those who are school droppers. We want that everyone should be on board because otherwise you cannot, the ship doesn't go, the ship doesn't go well. And, and so I think that this is no difference with many others, that um, we have a preschool education, which means that before you start at the age of seven, you have um, at least one year preschool education where uh, the experts can see that whether he or she can see or hear or understand or has an ability to work in the team and many other issues. And uh, most of the children are already in the kindergarten, in the daycare, when they are at the age of three, latest, two or three years old. And uh, so they learn to be with others because we have not too many children in the one family, so they learn to be not the star of the family, but with, with the uh, children of the same age. But even those who have been all the time at home, they learn with the preschool education how to, how to be with the others. And it seems to be so that it helps to, to make the gap between those families where the parents are very, very interested in education of those who do it if they have time or possibilities, and parents are different. So that's, I think, one of the very important issues. Uh, we do quite well with the young ones, but what we are facing also and what will be more and more burning problem in the future is that 
uh, we need a lifelong learning. I don't so say lifelong education, but lifelong learning. Because as soon as you will leave Harvard University, your education starts to become old-fashioned. And it happens much, much more rapidly what happened with your parents. And, and that's why I think that what we are tackling now is that we should be even better in the education and the kids because we don't know the future. We should somehow keep them all the time curious and, and um, creative and not only interest, interested in mathematics and natural sciences, which are, everybody says that they are important, but they should be also creative in order to be ready to, to go back to, to, to earning more. And all education in, in Finland is free, is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then we have also the warm, uh, warm school, school meals, uh, free of charge. Uh, it's, uh, we have, as I said, we have a rather large country and uh, it's scarcely populated uh, part of it, which means that also we have to see that how we bring the children to school even if it's when it's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you've been the head of the Council of Women World Leaders, as I remember, and certainly been engaged. You were a, a, a prominent leader. Um, have you found gender has made a difference in your career or how people treat you or how you, yes. or how you lead? Um, I, I have learned that I shouldn't put the too much jokes in this now, I think. This the is jokes a, are fine. This is, is very a good but, idea but here. gender is, is very dangerous in this sense. But, but anyway, I, uh, I think that, I don't know why, why it is so, but uh, very often the female politicians, uh, they uh, hear much more statements concerning how they look like than what they say. So uh, uh, when I paid my first state visit to Sweden as a president, and uh, we were prepared it very, very thoroughly, and, and so then, uh, when then I, I look at the newspaper, then I thought, what was the big issue? Because whether my handbag was too big or not. <laughs> 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 Those who are from Finland, they know, they remember that. So, so, so um, yeah, yeah, and then I learned that uh, the supreme chief of the army cannot have a suitable size of the handbag. It's better to <laughs> switch to somewhere else. But, but somehow, of course, even the men, you have become also in the same, you have learned to know the same problem nowadays, but TV is so important. So it's all the time looking at how he looked, but mainly that how she looked, what how was the hairdress, that, and was uh, that's so. And I think that this is now the first part. Then later on, when they learn to know you, they forget that you are a woman. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to find the balance in a way that you could look a, like a woman, but you shouldn't take mainly as a human being. And, so do yeah. you, and But you do get to that stage, or do you find that there are ways in which... Uh, I have stopped thinking. I'm the former president. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last question, then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, and uh, just to remind you, there are, que there are microphones at four locations, one here, one here, and then two up halfway up the stairs. Uh, so if you do have a question for the president, please join us. Um, obviously, you've got a long, a long border with Russia, as you said, for 100 mm -hmm. years. You were uh, a, uh, you called it an independent prefect, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, we used to be 700 years a forest trip between Sweden and, and Russia because we were the eastern part of Sweden. And, and so when Sweden had a, um, disagreements with, uh, with her neighbor, eastern neighbor, so the battle was in Finland. And then, as I said, in 18, 1809, the king of Sweden lost the war against Russia. And, and so, uh, so we... You joined Russia. No, but it's... This, this is very sensitive issue because we were independent Grand Duchy and with the Lutheran church and with our language and all of that, yeah. But um, after that, yes, we have had a neighbor who is sometimes Soviet Union, sometimes Russia. And your taxes have sometimes gone to Sweden and sometimes to Russia before it became? Mm, yes, yeah. yes. And so uh, this is a time of real change in Russia and uh, there's a period now of 
of concern about Ukraine, mm -hmm. the role of NATO and so forth. What insights can you give us about how to think about Russia and its place in the world and the current tensions in Ukraine more specifically? So, um, of course, as I said, we have had two wars in the, in the time of Stalin. So, the brother Stalin was not too friendly sometimes. But we, uh, we have kept all the time our independence. So, we are not naive. We are not naive, but uh, I think that the atmosphere in many other countries, including USA, has been much more nervous what it was in Finland. We are we are the Western country. We have been all the time the Western country. And we are the full member of the European Union, have been already uh, 20, 30, 25 years. And uh, we uh, are also full member in such a way that we have the Euro as an only, only Nordic countries, we, we have the Euro. We have taken always uh, actively part in the different kind of the security measures in the European Union. I think that we are true partner for the NATO. We have been under NATO leadership in, in, uh, in peacekeeping operations. We have led the NATO uh, operations. So I think that we are in that way good partner, like Sweden, Austria, Ireland, uh, Malta. So uh, in that way, I think that uh, if something would happen, we could be at least as good, good uh, friend for you like has been now the Ukraine or somebody else. I don't know. But do you think... Yeah, do you think that we are naive? I, I, I don't think anything. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just a dean. Medicine I don't have any uh, brain <laughs> cells <laughs> left. But, the, uh, uh, but in terms of Ukraine, do you think that is this is a, a source of great <laughs> consternation in the United States and parts of Europe and so forth? Uh, do you think that um, we're overreacting, not reacting enough, no. uh, in the way in which we people have been behaving? Is that do you think we're naive? I guess is the way I would no, put it. No, 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 no. I, I think that it was a um, big disappointment. It was a very sad story. And uh, of course, we know that, for instance, Crimea uh, was given by Hutzel, who's, who was Ukrainian, into the other. State the Soviet Union, but still, this against all international regulations and and uh, all this mess what we have had after that and all these sufferings what has happened. So um, yeah, it's a very very sad story. We could never believe that it would happen in the middle of middle of Europe. But um, but I do hope so that you keep USA keeps also the contact to speak. Uh, very often people ask me that, how is the Putin? Because I, I have known him since I was a foreign minister in the middle of 1990s, and of course, the, all the time when I was the president, I said, I have not spoken with him for one year. So I don't know what's in his head, but uh, it's better to keep contact that you know what he's thinking. It's the best, it's the closest way to, to, to find to know what he's doing. You don't need to agree. Uh, but you can, you, you should keep all the time contact because I think that perhaps it's since the Cold War time or whatever, but uh, I have the feeling and I think many Europeans share this, that USA is, uh, is the country the Russians uh, somehow listen. Somehow. Listen. Listen to. Yes, listen to. Interesting. All right, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Let me just remind you uh, what questions, a good question involves. If you could please identify yourself. Uh, keep your questions short with uh, um, a one point to it, and a good question should end with a question mark. So I'm going to start right here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, Madam President, you were formerly a trade union leader, mm -hmm. and actually I'll direct this question also at you, Dean Elwood, because I know you're a labor economist. So obviously one of the sort of major changes in, in the economies of both the United States and in Western Europe has been a pretty big decline in uh, union membership over the past number of decades, and some people attribute that to rises in inequality and, and decrease in social mobility and so on. So I'm wondering, from both of your perspectives, how would you sort of describe uh, the, these pretty significant changes in union, me union membership and how um, significant or how, how much has the impact of those changes been? 
So um, I think that concerning the Cuba Compact and many other, other issues of, uh, of the United Nations, uh, I, I try to help it with my, my, my ability to listen men's voices, but I, I do it. This is, I, no, no, this is not a strategy. I have, a, I have hurt my, my ear in the airport, but I think I can do it. So um, uh, I think that unions are very important because the decent work, as I said, it, people think that it's a part of the dignity of being human being. And, and unions are those who are, who are helping them. But unions are facing a very, very difficult issue because the capital has, has, uh, has uh, spread all over the world much, much, faster, much easier, they will do it with the modern IT in a in, in few seconds. And, and so the people, they have the different language, religious background, families, all that. So this is a great challenge. I was in um, last, uh, last December, I had an opportunity to be in Cape Town, where they have uh, an annual conference of UNI, UNI, which is the global, global union. And I think that the trend will be in the future that uh, the unions from the different countries and even it's not enough that they have the international organizations, but they have to become more and more, more global in a way to, to look after the, the benefits. But the other point, what I think is also important is that uh, um, whatever you work, so um, we should have a little bit uh, longer perspective for the job creation and and, uh, and uh, whether it's a private or public, because uh, otherwise you cannot invest enough for the ability of the people to work. So um, uh, in Finland, it was natural in the 1970s and 80s that all people, also the uh, public sector people, they were organized. And we have still about 80% organization level, which is very high compared in USA or France or so. But, uh, uh, but I admire very much the German and Swedish system where they have uh, uh, taken the, um, uh, where they have taken uh, representatives of unions and NGOs to the boards of the, boards of the enterprises uh, because this cooperative responsibility is very important. If we all only try to move, to make the sustainable development through the democratic system as such, we are always too late. We should put it in, in the production. And, and in that way, I, I think that uh, there are big, big challenges. I do hope so that uh, uh, unions can make also the transformation what's needed. Would you like to add? No? Okay. So. So I, I am going to just give a very short answer since I am not the guest. But just the main thing is to recognize that unions vary enormously in terms of their strength and so forth across Europe. The United States private sector unions are practically non-existent. They're getting so small in places like Finland. They s remain very large. They're also very different. Some have national uh, bargaining unions, uh, national agreements like in Germany and others not. And no question that a powerful uh, union sector can do a lot to deal with inequality, though it is worth noting that even in those countries where they have very strong unions, the, in the part of the problem is there are a lot of forces in the economy, you know, low wages in other countries and so forth, that make it very difficult to but, uh, but I think we agree that IROS uh, um, course is, is very important. The basic rights should be correct. I mean, you might have a differences in salaries and, and in, in in uh, working conditions, depending that which, uh, uh, which type of the country it is. But it's very important that it should be legal first to, to organize yourself, and it should have the legal rights to negotiate, and, and then it should be more or less transparent system. Uh, so, so I think that even uh, in those circumstances, in many countries, you could have a much, much better uh, situation what is today. Mm -hmm. and, and so I mean that uh, let's not be too sophisticated sometimes. That in, in Germany it's normal that you participate in the, in the board of or the, with, the, with the specific foundation of the corporation. In Sweden the same, you have the Freitagsdemokratie like they say in Sweden. 
Swedish, and, and we have a somewhat in Finland also. But, uh, but the, uh, the workers in, in many countries, in India, Pakistan, wherever, they would be happy if they can legally organize themselves and they could have an, the basic, uh, basic uh, request fulfilled. Right up here. Hello. Hello. My name is Patrick. Um, so thank you for coming here to the forum. The question I had is, um, what important truth about women uh, do most men fail to understand? Fine, fine. Uh, the very important issue is also the UN campaign, he for she. So, applauses. So, because I think that it's very important to see that both the women and men are half of the population. And um, even though it has been sometimes the um, colorful stories about the gender war or war between the genders and so on, the most of us, we would like to be good partners at least. And in that way, I think that the Chinese uh, idea of the yin and yang and all those in different form is still true today. Uh, when we have uh, reforms or, or the role of the woman has changed so much in the most of the countries, so the male uh, human beings, they have to, to see that how they see their own role. And, and so I think that there are benefits and there are perhaps some, some roles uh, power also, but also the benefits. So I think that the fathers today, they, ha they take part much more in the family life. And at least with the Nordic women, I will say, they will consider it natural that uh, you are looking after the baby and you are going with the friends and, and you do, as they say, not only helping her, but doing the half of the duties. I think that my security here, who is a, is a Finnish, a Finnish man with two kids, can, can uh, sign this confession that that's normal for the men. Um, not for quite everyone, but for instance, my generation, men didn't, they, they accepted the principle, but they some are much better. But the good thing is that the, my spouse and all his generation are better than their father. So I do believe that uh, people will be different. But don't think that all men and all women are similar. Some women are active outside of home, some men are active outside of home, some are not. So I mean that let's underline the fact that we should uh, treat each other like an equal, equal citizens of this planet. So it's much better. So we, we can be more flexible that uh, which kind of the personal or sexual identity one have. But what I think is that truth is that only the women can get the babies, with the help of the men, of course. But, <laughs> but then this special fact that women can get the babies, deliver the babies, make the situation in working life a little bit different. And, and that's why society, the state or the local authority, if they want to, to get the full capacity of the both men and women in the future work, they should also to show their helping hand and um, to do it with the maternity leaves or the pattern uh, with the, with also with the, with the parental leaves and, and they should give the possibilities for the clinics and, and daycare services and, and all such kind of things. Because families, they are not so big they used to be. So this is a quite limited time they will use of their whole life for the next generation. So. Uh, let's be in that way more generous. And I always say to the, to the women, if I speak only for the young women, and now I say it also so that the young men can hear, I normally say that it's two important things you have to do. One is study hard, and next you have to be very smart when you choose your spouse. <laughs> but it's the same another way around. It's the same other way around, that uh, uh, family, demands quite a lot, even the happy families or what we think. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, and in that way, you can take both. You can get the both, but together with your spouses. And even better, you should pick good parents. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's uh, good. My husband always says that the first human rights should be that you can choose your parents, but when you cannot do that, so we others can have to help. Okay. And, and so I think that's the reason, this the base also for the Nordic Purpose Society. It makes the start of the life a little bit more even. Right over here. Hi, um, my name is Leia Singer and I'm a junior at the college. My question for you is on universal health care. Um, Finland has seen enormous success in that respect and here in the United States it remains, well, nothing short of contentious. I was wondering what is it that made it so successful and what lessons might the U.S. be able to take from your model? So World Health Organization has counted that uh, uh, to create the health uh, business on markets, it's, uh, it's a certain size of the population which could be suitable. And Finland has uh, 5.4 million people. So um, the country is so small, I mean, as a population, the area is very large, and uh, the distances are quite long. So um, it used to be before we have this uh, healthcare system, it, seemed it, it was so that the main uh, part of the doctors and health services were in the south, in the bigger cities. And then we noticed that people had few long ways in the countryside. They had some doctors who were... I could call them county doctors they had, but, uh, but the situation was much worse. After we made the health reform, so now the health centers are working very well in the countryside. In uh, bigger cities where they had a lot of private doctors earlier, so it has not always succeeded as well. Uh, but um, mainly people are very, very happy to get the universal uh, health service system. We have I said very openly, we have a double system. We have also the private doctors, but they are not real private in such a way that uh, we subsidize the, the, uh, the, uh, the services in a way that when you go to the private doctor and you get the bill, so one part of that will be subsidized. But it's still more expensive than uh, that the, the public. Uh, the best part of the public health has been always the maternity care, the children's health care, and, and then the senior citizens' health care. Those who are in the working life, very often they, they have or had also the different kind of arrangement. Uh, but we are very convinced that it's not, not only the most effective and uh, in that way good for the people, but it's also the least expensive system. If you compare those who are working in the health sector, you can, you can compare the investment what we have done. It's a little bit the same like in education, that we don't use the high sums of the, the GDP, from the GDP for health or for education, but we got a reasonably good result. So uh, the public sector can be also effective. And of course it can, the same people working there. Uh, so in that way, we think that when it's both fair and effective and less expensive. So that's what we like. Very good. Right up here. My name is Isabel. I'm an alumni of the college and also a staff member here at the Belfer Center at HKS. I'd like to ask the, basically the same question in relation to in your environmental policies and um, work to combat climate change. Um, so what do you see as the strengths of Finland's policies um, and current actions, and what lessons might you have for the United States? Oh. So we are not so specially good in <laughs> editing. Uh, so I, I think that um, uh, one thing concerning the sustainable development has been that, as I already mentioned, that uh, we, are n we have not been so lucky that we would have uh, gas and oil and all possible natural resources. So uh, we had to invest the resource we thought that we have, and it was a population. And when we also noticed that we were small, like other Nordic countries too, so we have found also easily, perhaps more easily, the cooperation, international cooperation, because we cannot have an idea that we can change the world. But we have to do it together. Um, I think that we are very much still, uh, how could I say, used to be, with the nature. 
So we have not too yet urbanized. Even a majority lives already in the, in the cities. But if you come to midsummer night to Helsinki, you'll think that it, it, it's empty. People have disappeared somewhere to the nature. And that happens in, in many other big holidays also. So we still have this need to have a close contact. But um, we have not always behaved very, very well with this nature. I take one example. Uh, what I think that could be a piece of good, um, if not uh, advice, but uh, sharing the, the experience. So we have the Baltic Sea. Baltic Sea is a um, very fragile sea because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not too deep and it's almost close. It's, of course, the, it, technically it's part of the Atlantic, but it's uh, really very narrow and low. And that's why when uh, about 90 million people live around that, um, not only Nordic countries, but Baltic states, Russia, Poland, so on, uh, and also there's some rivers in Ukraine are part. So, so there's, how would I say, uh, it could be cleaner. So um, one, one big reason was that in, um, our, our eastern neighbor didn't clean her waste water. They, they went directly for toilet to, to the Baltic Sea. And uh, like uh, Mr. Garmasino, who was the, the, who is the director of the Bodo Canal there, St. Petersburg water system, he said that since uh, Russian charts, nothing has, ma has made. But then they started the cooperation together with Finland, with EU, and step by step we created a new wastewater system. Now the wastewater system of St. Petersburg is better than what the EU criteria demand. So now they made it in, let's say, in less than in 10 years. Now we try the same system with the different countries. We notice that the international cooperation is possible, but it's not very easy, even between these nine countries we have there nearby the Baltic Sea and coming back to Ukraine. So we have now difficulties to have a good contact because uh, uh, both the USA and EU thinks, and I think the Russians are also in the same line, that no, not too much now. Mm. But I hope that you can make a deal and, and we can continue, continue with the sustainable development. And I think that this is only a very slight, very, very easy picture anyway. If you think the different parts of the world, the different parts of the, our globe, uh, the difficulties between the neighbors can be much worse. And still we know that for the de sustainable development, we should somehow to create a cooperation. And uh, for instance, in Asia, um, there is an issue of the Himalaya mountains and the snow, disappearing snow there. We have a good cooperation with Nepal and Bhutan and some others, but, but uh, the neighbors have sometimes difficulties with them. And, and so I think that one of the good ideas for you, for the excellent university, could create an ideas how we can build in, uh, practical cooperation in, in environmental issues in different parts of the world and take a very interesting and, and a difficult task too. This will be the last question. William, the Extension School is my connection. And um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, huve puve mente kulu. Ja, kitos, kitos. Okay, you, you have been in Finland. Uh, many times I've been to Finland. I have many friends there, a uh, wonderful country. Um, many, set, st many summers at the Esplanade. Okay. Um, your icebreaker technology, given the cold weather, I've been had those shown off to me many times that you keep those northern uh, oceans very clear for the researchers and so forth. If you could speak to that, because they brag about it a lot. And you're very popular there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was very nice. Do you want to say anything about your icebreakers? I would say concerning the icebreakers that uh, I don't think that you will need them so much in the future either. But. But um, uh, if we come to the sustainable development, so the latest, uh, latest promising uh, findings of uh, oil and gas are in very north. 
And uh, I think that we should take it very, very carefully to think that what you can do in the most Arctic areas, because the nature there is um, very fragile. And if there happens an accident there, as it is possible by, by human beings, so it would be very difficult to, to help the situation. So coming to the icebreakers, yes, we have good icebreakers, and now we are starting to, to build them in our shipyards again. Uh, and we have seen that how globalization has affected to the, to the markets of the uh, ferry yards. So it's not too easy, not too easy. Sometimes we have owned them, sometimes Norwegians have owned, sometimes South Korea has owned them, sometimes uh, Russians and so on. You never know that to whom you are working if you are in the shipyard. But, um, but I think that um, we need more and more transport system and infrastructure, but we should think also, please, that this is the only planet we have. So I hope that uh, so one you last will continue. Last one last question is from, from me, which is, in the audience, we have a quite a number of people that aspire to public service. Uh, some of them would even like to be president of their countries. Um, what advice would you have for them? I think that I have tried to say all the time that the, the world is full of the possibilities. And if you are working in the public sector, be proud of that, because you are working for the common good. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, take also the, your experience from your, uh, from your own work to, for the discussions, also for political discussions. I have tried to follow your, your Obamacare system here. And um, I hope that you can find a consensus because uh, you have to do a lot more if you want to get a Nordic system, what we have concerned that it's effective, it's democratic, and it's less expensive. Thank you. Thank you very much. us. I want to thank uh, Gianna Angelopoulos for her um, making this all possible. Holly Sargent is also here. She was a part of making that happen. So thank you all uh, and please uh, have a safe trip home. Yes. Um, I hope to see some of you students. I will be here um, to the last day of April and I have promised also to be at least with those who are in the health sector. So I'm, I'm available there and, and uh, so that's a good use for the money. Yeah, Thank you. okay.